Good morning, Green Spring. I'm your host today, Avon Price here at Channel 6. We have a really good show for you today and a little backstory. Um, I started about a year ago and getting to know these residents, you the residents around here, I noticed that all you have amazing stories. I mean, I've met people who saw Pearl Harbor from their backyard. I've seen pe I've met people who lived in China with an American mother, but I just wanted to somehow be able to capture these people's stories, you the resident stories, and see history through your eyes. So step back and let's see Ann Herman's story living and experiencing the Holocaust. Stay tuned. Throughout time, humans have aided in the shaping of history, but... History can be subjective. From time to time, our accounts of history don't always match. So... This is history through my eyes. Young City. Do you, not, do you need to wear your glasses? Just what do you think is better? Because it might be a reflection. Yeah, I really actually like your blue eyes. Okay. Your blue eyes look it's great. Better. Wow. Yeah. Okay, good Actually, enough. You look great. Okay, thank you. In fact, you look better than I see you. 93. You're 93? Yeah. Oh my God. Beyond, actually. I mean, uh, what is it, two months, I think. Yeah. Wow. All right, now I want to ask you, know, where, did, where did it all start? Uh, well, I was born in Nuremberg, Germany. Well, I, I had very wonderful parents. My grandparents, we were a very uh, close family, and I had a half-sister who was not too well. So, uh, and my mother was my father's second wife, so. We lived uh, between, uh, sort of right in this middle of suburbs and city. It wasn't the real city because there were only very old buildings and all that. At that time, that was before World War II. Really, his way, but it was a, a very cohesive family life, and uh, I was very happy. So I went to a good school, a lycée, and we had studied English. I had some Jewish friends. And we had studied English, and uh, it was a very uh, a life without any problems, really. My father was, there's really no English word for that, an Oberlandesgerichtsrat, that means a, one of the superior churches at the highest court in Bavaria. The seat actually was in Munich. Of, the, of that particular section of, um, of the judicial uh, community, let's put it that way. Until April 1st, 1933, my life was very, very usual. old enough to see certain things but not old enough to understand uh, a number of incidents, problems and so forth. But uh, I certainly was on April 1st, 1933, that was the crucial date when Hitler became, well he became Chancellor in January 19. 33, but then three months later, then they took really action against uh, the Jewish community.
sondern die heute in Berlin leben. Morgen genau ich würde zurück. school and the other the other kids I say other kids the non-jewish section of the class of course didn't like didn't like us there was no uh, getting no uh, communicating or no walking together even and I, I had I was not that lucky that in my class were the children twins of our mayor at that time. And that, of course, was pretty bad for them because to be together in class with a Jew, you have no idea about the, the um, being such enemies in, the, in that German society, uh, how that plays out. N nobody really knows that. Or if it does, it would be on the front page of the Times. But we didn't associate, we managed our own business and tried to behave, very important. Well, I, we were not very comfortable, certainly not. I mean, uh, you know, you terrible stories were circulated about what the Jews did and how um, dangerous we were, in you know, dangerous in quotes, it isn't quite right. But yes, uh, we lived, and my parents certainly lived in fear. We did not socialize with our neighbors, not at all. Here I know all my neighbors, of course. It's an entirely different relationship. But in Europe, you don't say, hello, Joe, to a stranger, which I do that here. You know, if, I meet, if I'm alone in the woods and I meet somebody, you know, I'm friendly, why shouldn't I be? And I say hello, and usually uh, the other person responds. And uh, that's a very, but uh, in Europe, no, I, we didn't know our neighbors, didn't want to know them. The, there was a word that, uh, that Uganda, I don't even know, I think Uganda is in Africa, that Uganda was going to take some refugees, if, as we were called. And my father was 65, which was quite elderly at that time. Uh, 65 nowadays is nothing. <laughs> and they did not decide. And my grandparents, they did emigrate at an advanced age. Advanced age, I have to say, they were already in the high 70s. They emigrated to Israel. My parents certainly lived in fear. When I left Germany in 1939, I was limited in luggage, and it was very hard. I, I came to England, not, certainly not by car, what's nowadays. I was very fortunate to be shipped on a children transport from Germany to Great Britain because the United States did not take any, anybody at all, any children I'm talking about, under the age of uh, seven. They didn't, and they were very restrictive because Roosevelt was involved with other more important matters, very much involved, and finally he consented to take 1,000 Jewish children. But Great Britain accepted 10,000 Jewish children. So that was easier, but it certainly wasn't easy to get on a transport. I left middle of the night. My parents took me to the railway station. I really didn't quite understand the enormity of this um, um, leaving uh, home. And uh, I, we were I joined a group that, that train was full of Jewish children, or I don't know, but other religions. Very few blacks, just to mention that, because there weren't any in, at that time in Germany. And um, it was quite a trip because I was one of the oldest young people. And of course, I had to help 
uh, calming down. The little ones, they had children on that train, were two and three years old. I mean, these kids didn't know what was happening to them. And, well, it was a long trip from Nuremberg to London, actually. concerned about what's going to be, but I was sure, I was a hundred percent sure that I would see my parents again. And I was very fortunate because in England we were assigned to certain families. And my parents had, friends of my parents had come to uh, London about a a year earlier, <clears throat> and of course they picked me up at the station from that train, and um, and that was very helpful, of course. But everybody spoke to me English, and I didn't understand one word. So, well, I had I, we had English lessons, but uh, <laughs> how much you know everybody was excited and uh, i didn't understand one word i figured well, whatever they do what they do and um, but i was assigned to a and i was very fortunate to a lovely family in the north of england in a smaller town and i was very grateful for that but i was actually very concerned they had planned to send me to school which I, I was glad because some of my acquaintances had to be maids and, uh, you know, I mean, really very unpleasant jobs. Not maid isn't so unpleasant, but all kinds of things, or work in the fields. But I, it was planned that I would be going to school, and I was just delighted about that because uh, I guess they talked to me or somehow tested me. But uh, so I went to school. I was also worried how with the other kids comes a foreigner doesn't even speak the language i mean what but uh, i learned the language never get rid of my accent but i tell you a funny story afterwards uh, and uh, the headmistress was exceptionally helpful and i was assigned certain classes i didn't take i didn't need to take math or any of that stuff but really classes that would help in my regular life. Hi, I'm Kelly Luke Shander, the Community Resources Coordinator in Town Center. I was just looking at our monthly activities calendar. Come on in, we'll see what's going on. Each month, you can find one of these monthly activities calendars at a front desk in your community building. In the calendar, you'll find a day-by-day -day breakdown of everything going around on campus. So if you're looking for something to do, that's the place to look. Also, if you're ever looking for something else to do and you're in town center, come stop by my office and we can talk about anything that's going on, or if you'd like to create a group of your own with your own interests. Anyway, my door is always open. This is Kelly. We teach five water classes a week, but we have over a hundred classes a month. We're hoping that you can find something that you like on the land or in the water to keep yourself fit. And it's such a great social activity too. You become friends with everybody here in your classes and um, it's a wonderful way to enjoy yourself at Greenspring. So come on, join a class, won't you? And have some fun. I 
left for the United States in 1940, the ship landed in New York City. It was known to be uh, a tough city, very tough, but that there was li very little else in the whole United States. I mean, at that time, one, which wasn't true, of course, but we had absolutely no idea what did I know about New York City, nothing. But eventually I, I settled there, I had a furnished room and bought myself a map and uh, to get around and uh, that was it and I really, I lived there for 60 years and I love the city and I know my way very well around, took the underground or the subway. Morning, noon, at night, I was at midnight on the subway, and I'm still here. I mean, here at Greensboro, oh my goodness, uh, not everybody is a robber or a killer. And I had some wonderful experiences in New York City. And I emphasize city. Um, so, very on, then I tried to get work, and I was also very difficult because I got a job through a, an acquaintance in New Jersey, and I traveled every day, two hours in the morning and two hours at night to get back and commuting by ferry, train, first by subway, ferry, and train. So it, that was, I knew I, I couldn't do it longer than two years, and I shouldn't do it, and I quit one day <laughs> after a strike, we, the factory went on strike over there, and I, it was a good excuse for me because I didn't earn any money and I left. And then I walked the streets of New York looking for an art studio that they might need some help. I was totally inexperienced, I had no education in, in, in the graphic arts, none whatsoever. And I said, well, I also handle the payroll. Never in my life did I do any payroll work. But uh, one studio owner, I guess either he felt sorry for me or he's kind of, I don't know, he gave me a job. And I worked there for quite some time. Sometime I would say two years, three years doing the payroll and uh, cleaning the floor with the broom. And seeing what, these, what, what was done in the art field, I had no idea. And then, um, but that studio had pretty good accounts, and the, the salesman always came over from Look Magazine. Look Magazine was a, it's, it's, it does not exist anymore, but it was a very reputable magazine, and. Uh, they had somebody, a salesman, come over. We did a quite a bit of artwork for them for a look. And uh, he thought whether I would like to work for them. I said, I'd be delighted because I worked in kind of a sweatshop, but look was not a sweatshop. And uh, so I worked there a few years. And in fact, a, an acquaintance of a friend of mine also got a job there. They were, I guess, a little more ready to, to help or whatever, and enjoyed it very much. And after look, I, but then I got married, and then I, I continued working, and then for some reason, a very good reason, I, I had a connection to Columbia Broadcasting, to CBS. 
by that time, luckily, I knew, uh, had more knowledge how to do what and all that stuff in graphic arts. And I also photography was included. And I came to Columbia Broadcasting for a couple of years, which was very delightful, and I really enjoyed that very much. But then our boy was born, and I, we could not afford, really not afford, uh, any help. So I had to quit, unfortunately. And I think later on I went back for just a very short time. Uh, but my hours were limited. I had, when the boy was little, I had to be home at a certain time. However, during all these years, my parents-in-law arrived in New York City by ship also, without a penny. So the, the, the little salary that I earned and my husband earned had to be for four people and with the boy five. So that wasn't easy either, but it, we managed. And uh, CBS was really uh, very special, my years there, and I met interesting people there. My husband was not as fortunate. He didn't have, uh, he didn't earn that much, and we were really dependent on my earnings. And then when things quieted down and our boy grew up and then college and all that, and I had lots more time, and then I heard, I heard about working for the New York Times, where I worked for 18 years. And that was really like a heaven for me. I enjoyed it, and I was really, I must say, very conscientious, and got well paid, and the whole family was very happy. I'm very, very independent. Luckily, I don't need a, a penny from them. And luckily, I'm very self-sufficient because I started early in life. And uh, they say, if you need shopping, I do, my, I do everything. I really don't need them, but I know I have family, my son. But otherwise, everybody was killed or in the meantime, passed away. Do you, did you ever find out what happened to your parents? Yes, yes, I found out, not I, but I was notified that they were killed in, in different camps. And of course, that really was very, very, it still is very hard for me now. First of all, I got a telegram from, from the State Department. It, it took a while, but I, I assumed there was absolutely no hope, and uh, I was told even by this very nice couple who took me in and their two daughters. It did leave. Uh, uh, these experiences left the track, there's no question about it. My son is very, very good, um, and he has obviously a wife and three children. And the kids, really, they're all grown up now. I'd like to maybe end this by saying I personally feel that I cannot make the grandchildren of the, pet, of the folks who did all these crimes, these are now the generation now are the grandchildren, I really cannot make them responsible for the act, acts of their parents and grandparents. I mean, they were just born around that time. Later, most of them later even, 1960s, 70s, 80s. And uh, they really had nothing. In fact, Germany is known as one of the most democratic countries in Europe. Also, they do very well, of course. I admire that. I knew, and my husband obviously also knew, we had to manage and we had to succeed. And this is, to this day, still my motto. And I'm very grateful. I, when I became a citizen, I thought that is a really, that nothing better could have happened to me, and it's a fact. If I wouldn't have then just come over here with the necessary papers, it wasn't uh, facilitated in any way, but I was determined not to perish in Europe.
this is history through my eyes.